Today is December the 19th. I'm interviewing Pauline Gravier and I'm Nancy Ungerman. Hello, Pauline. Happy, Hello, happy holidays. This is really exciting. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself, where you were raised, and um, if you were raised in Dallas, if you were born in Dallas. I, I was, mm -hmm. actually. I was born in Florence and Nightingale Hospital, which was a part of Baylor. And do you want the year? Sure. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> October 23rd, 1934. Uh -huh. So I'm 77 now. Mm -hmm. And I was born on my mother's birthday, which was always a source of great pleasure for us. And my mother was named Regina Pierce. Uh, she was Regina Hart, and she was born in actually Mahia, Texas. But at three weeks of age, she and her father and mother moved to College Station. Her father was a cotton broker. I'm not sure if cotton bro buyer or cotton broker. Mm -hmm. And so his fortunes went up and down mm -hmm. with the economy. And all I know is that they moved there, and then later on, uh, she moved to Dallas. And that's a whole story in itself. But So she was born in Texas, yeah, too? Yeah. Uh -huh. College and, Station uh -huh. uh, is where she was raised, uh -huh. uh, which, of course, is where Texas A&M is. And the only thing that her beloved daughter ever did to disappoint her was I never dated a Texas Aggie. <laughs> <laughs> And she wanted me to go to the dances because she had so such she, a wonderful time. There, um, she had a little sister who was uh, 11 or 13 months younger named Rose. And then um, a little brother and the mother and the child died in childbirth. Oh. So uh, Papa was left as a single parent with two little girls because I think mother was maybe... Three, the sister was maybe one and a half, and then that's mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. so he's left with these two little girls, and we she moved into a boarding house. And then, I'm not sure what the year was, he took both of these children, put them on a ship with him, and they went to Berlin, where his sister uh, was living, and his sister was married, had no children. I think she was already divorced. This is really interesting. Yeah. People didn't. She wasn't, her name was uh, Frida Kaiser. And she was, of course, a heart before that. I think that's the name. I don't think it was changed. And, um, and she, uh, after my mother and sister had come home, and then a year or two later, went back and spent a year in Berlin and came back when my mother was like six and Aunt Rosie was maybe a year and a half, uh, maybe four and a half. And they came back and Tanta came and moved to College Station to raise the little girls. And she was, she was the aunt, so she was called Tanta. When they came back and mother was six, I think, she spoke English and German, and the little sister only spoke German. And my mother tell, told the story of going to pick up Tanta when she had made this oceanic voyage, then taken the train from New York City to Bryan, Texas. And Grandpa, my, her father, rented a carriage and a horse, and they went to pick her up at night in the middle of a rainstorm. And she said, can you imagine this cultured Berliner who had the works of Goethe memorized and who was truly an intellect? She steps off the train onto a wooden platform with wooden sidewalks, a few of them, and outhouses, and steps into College Station, Texas. So uh, she raised these mm -hmm. daughters, these little girls. And then when my mother was in 1919, mother was born in 1898, and in 1919, I guess mother was 21, they, meaning Tanta and her brother, the father, and the two girls moved to Forest Avenue, 
in South Dallas, what we call South Dallas, which was down the street from the state fair. Mm -hmm. It's now Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And it's one block over from South Boulevard, which of course is now a historic landmark. And there were these two girls, and they were the bells of the ball. They had been the bells of the ball <laughs> in, in, um, in College Station. Very few Jews, but whatever Jews there were at Allen Academy and Texas A&M, and later on an army base during World War I, all gathered at their house along with the Hillel directors, Mr. and Mrs. Talbot House. And they, so they all came to Dallas, and I, I'm born now in um, 1934. My mother and dad met in, I've forgotten exactly where, they had a long courtship because daddy was totally broke, and I'll <laughs> tell you about him in a minute. And they eventually married and moved to Milwaukee. She immediately got pregnant with my big brother Leonard. They moved back to Dallas. They had the baby. And eight years later, I came along in 1934, which was two years before the big centennial mm -hmm. in 1936. So I'm two years old, and that's what I remember was people flowing into our house mm -hmm. to come to the centennial. And as I grew older, what I remember mostly were the German, the many German refugees who were getting out of Germany, and they would, there were so many friends of Tantas, mm -hmm. and they all came flowing into our house, and sometimes would live there for weeks and months at a time, and we had a big, ham, you know, sort of a rambling house on Forest Avenue. Meanwhile, <laughs> is this getting to be too much? Do you want to ask? No, I'll be question? asking questions. Go on. This is fascinating. Meanwhile, my father is born in 1900 in New York City. And he was the youngest of four boys. Uh, the two older boys were born in Vienna, Austria. And his father was uh, the court violinist for Franz Joseph. Ah. apparently concertmaster or conductor of Franz Joseph's uh, orchestra. Wow. And Len has done some, my husband has done some research. It turns out that all of them were musicians going back generations, all professional musicians, and still some of them are, although uh, this uh, information is secondhand from maybe a distant, distant, distant cousin who really has done his, his research. And so anyway, um, there are the two boys, and they're small, much, I don't know how old they are, and apparently, according to my father, uh, their parents were very um, cultured, and remember the story of Meyerling with Prince Rudolph and his paramour, he was married, and uh, he had this woman he madly loved, but he couldn't marry because she was a commoner. And they used to meet at my grandfather and grandmother's home to have their some, you know, dinner parties or whatever. And eventually they went off to Meyerling, which was the castle, and they had a, he, a double suicide. It's a very, very famous story. Yeah, give and, me a date on that. Yeah, um, yeah, I need to look it up. Uh -huh. But anyway, they came to the United States where he was the first orchestra leader of the Waldorf Astoria. Mm. And I've tried to get information on that, but the Waldorf didn't keep records. Mm. At any rate, then two other boys were born, my father being the youngest, and his older brother was uh, a two years older. Uh, they were orthodox. My father always resented the fact that later on his mother would um, hire a Shabbos goy <laughs> for the weekend. And later on when my father and mother married, he was very happy to become reformed. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, um, so they're in and they're living in where apparently all Jews live, the Lower East Side. And apparently his father died in what was probably the big flu epidemic of 1902 and leaving his mother and four children. 
And the mother was, as he said, an aristocrat. She was cultured, she was educated, and she had never turned to work. And so she, the two bigger boys were not through high school, and they went out to, to work. The two little boys were put in the Hebrew orphanage. And they um, were little, and my, they stayed there through a, a couple of years of high school. And Rabbi Lefkowitz, who was Temple Emmanuel's rabbi for so long, was one of the proctors. He used to walk the little boys back and forth to school. Oh. And apparently while he was studying, that's the way he made money. At any rate, uh, the mother then uh, turned and she ran a boarding house. This is what Len, Lenny was able to turn up. And she also, my father, didn't talk much about the boarding house, but he did talk about the, the business deal she would make. She apparently traded things, and, and that's the end of all I know about that. But she did was living, and he said that every other week she would get on about three streetcars, and she would ride to the orphanage, and she would bring each of them an orange. Mm -hmm. And that was a tremendous treat, a mm -hmm. tremendous treat. He left the orphanage in, after about one or two years of high school, and he, too, moved back home, and he went out to go to work, which was, I don't know what he was doing, but I'm not sure that all of it was totally, um, you know, any way to make a book. Mm -hmm. He was always very honest, but I don't think he cheated anybody, but he made a book in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. When he was um, 17, he enlisted in, in the Army in World War I, and he got out in world, uh, at the end, and as he says, uh, I found myself on the streets of New York City. My mother had died. My brothers had disappeared. The family friend, ha family friend had stolen whatever money or keepsake she had. He says, I find myself on the streets of New York with $40 in my pocket and the uniform on my back. Mm -hmm. And he had always, he had bad, bad memories from New York City. He hopped the train. He rode the rails like a hobo. This is 1919. So it's just a bit, uh, maybe a little younger, earlier than when Mother moved to Dallas. And he rode the rails. And he had a fascinating life for, I, I don't know, a few years, he um, came down to Texas, and he was a border guard along the Rio Grande. Uh, now, here's a man with no education, just a year, maybe a year and a half of high school, and he, um, he talked himself into that. He was a sheep herder in Arizona for one night. He couldn't stand that. <laughs> he, went, he went out to Los Angeles and there was some of uh, a uh, boyhood prince. His brother was friends with Samuel Goldwyn. And he got a job as, some, as an extra. And he got out somehow to, up to Milwaukee where he was. And this was all on the railroad. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Or hitchhiking. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I know the railroad, you know, it was very dangerous. Those, um, if, if you got on the uh, train and there were hobos on the train, they could easily murder you or throw you off the train and kill you. Uh, very dangerous. So I don't know how much he did that, but he hitchhiked a lot. Mm -hmm. And he ended up in Milwaukee. He was selling um, oriental carpets and crystal radio sets in Chicago. And he was selling carpets. And he said the reason that he outsold everybody is that he spun a tale about each carpet and how it was made. You know, there were whole families who worked on these things. So he said he embellished it a little bit, but he <laughs> sold a lot. <laughs> and he was very charismatic. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, he had come down to Dallas and had gone on the road selling, as he said, schmatas. He was selling stuff. And uh, he, what, he got a car somehow. I guess he paid on time or whatever, if they had that. And he traveled the roads. And I get mixed up about whether he was, I think he didn't turn, I know before he and mother were married, he was a roughneck in the oil fields. Uh, a 
a roughneck is, you know, for people who may be watching this, that's that's heavy work. Mm -hmm. It's also dangerous. Dad was about five foot nine, and and stocky and very strong. His wrists were enormous. His neck was big, and he was very strong. And one time when he and mother were courting, he uh, would ride. He didn't have a car then. He'd ride the trolley to see her, and. Um, one time he got off going home, I think he was living in a rooming house, and a car came along and knocked him down. And the car went over his chest, so I can see it. Here's his head between the wheels. The car, both wheels go over his chest, and the other car wheels did not. And he got up and walked home. Now, the cars were not weighing what they weigh now, but still... <laughs> worked life. And the next day he told, when he came to see mother, he told her, and she says, I don't believe you. And he took off his shirt and there were the tire marks across his chest. Oh. Oh, uh, but he was like a, a bull and he, very, very strong. And he um, was a great fisherman. He had learned to fish somehow, because he's a city boy. I don't know where he learned it. But when mother met him, he was already going fishing. And that's the way I remember growing up. How did they meet? They met when she was a Sunday school teacher for Temple Emmanuel, and he was the first Boy Scout leader. And they met and apparently fell in love and never dated anybody else. And I don't think they married for at least seven years, though. So because she was not really young. She was in her 30s when they married, I think, and dad too. And um, then, of course, she had Leonard very, uh, you know, right away, and there was an, a stillbirth somewhere in the middle, and then me eight years later. And she was a 100, just past 100 when she died. That makes three Centuries. Well, if she had lived six more days, uh -huh. she would have lived in three centuries. Because she's born in 1898, mm -hmm. and she died at on December 24th, huh? 1999. <laughs> and she was trying to hang on. And she was still, for those people who knew her, and there will be a history of her, because I found it, there'll be a history of her. She was just as bright and smart and with it as she ever was until about three months before she died when her body just wore out. Mm -hmm. uh, the mind just slowed, just slowed, you know, it was never dementia. She just was, her body just wore out. And so she died just before three centuries, but um, a brilliant, just wonderful woman. And Regina Pierce, she was um, on the board of Temple Emmanuel for about 60 years, truly, maybe more. I think she went on when she was a Sunday school teacher and never went off. Mm -hmm. But she was always being asked to host the welcoming committee or the committee to meet people because she was a great introducer. Mm -hmm. And she'd, if somebody was new, she'd take them and introduce them. And she did that all her life not just for the temple, but she wanted her friends to be friends with all of her friends. And she was hospitable and warm and and growing up in this house with Tanta and Papa, that's what I call my grandfather, my mother and dad, Leonard and me, and then who knows who was at the table. Some were living with us and some not. And I was always welcome to bring friends home at the last minute for dinner. I never knew how many people were going to be at the table. And it was a wonderful, warm, hospitable way. Uh, oh, you, you're, you're here. I've just met you. Well, come to dinner right away. Just come with me right away. <laughs> and, wow. and, and, of course, with all the um, people from Texas, my father eventually did uh, become a landman. And that's a whole other story I want to tell you about, too, because that's so interesting. And he does not have a record. He died 
at the end of 1978 during the great ice storm here and he died as dramatically as he lived. He was very dramatic. I just finished with mother because she lived till uh, the very beginning of this century. So that's not very long ago. That's only 11 years ago. So it really kept your father here was your mother because he would have, he could have just That's popped. right. That is right. I mean, he was a and wanderer. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. He didn't have roots till he met mm -hmm. mother and he loved Tanta. And, and Papa got ill. I think he had dementia and he died when I was eight, so I really don't have very firm memories. Tonto was the power and the intellect and the, the head of the household who cooked and sewed and she made mothers and Aunt Rosie's dresses until they were adults um, and a wonderful cook, but she never taught them to do this. She was always in a hurry, as you can well imagine. You, there was no ref when she moved there to Texas. There was no refrigeration, no electricity, no tele. Well, there was a party line, I think. Um, outhouses. Um, everything had to be done by hand. Mm -hmm. And she loved these little girls, and they adored her. But she did not. Well, let me let me put it this way. She did not understand how to. Um, well, let me, I think it, I can sum this up. She once said to my mother when she was about eight years old or nine years old or ten or something, Rosie's a year and a half earlier, she says, Gina, my mother was named Regina with a hard G and everybody called her Gina. Gina, she says, Rosie is beautiful, but you're good. Oh. And my mother never forgot it. And she really wasn't. Um, she was on the plain side. She had just awful hair that she never could do anything with. Rosie, younger, had big blue eyes and golden curls. And there was a considerable difference. I've got a picture of her as a young girl. And you can see. And my mother had that within her. But Lee, my father, was a handsome dude. And he fell madly in love with her. And she's the one who ended up being the most attractive. And, and I get, you know, there's dynamics in every family, you know. Mm -hmm. But she's the one who really lived the great life. And after years of penny pinching and years, they said, of really not knowing where they were going to have the next meal coming from, um, my father finally found a business that he started. So can I take a breath for a minute and then I'll tell you Absolutely. more about my dad? Absolutely. Okay, so here they are, but let me rewind just a minute because as you, as you said to me in the break, I am the amalgamation of, of, my, of my parents and I was incredibly lucky to, to have this. My father... Uh, I, I don't think I can hold a candle to my dad as far as charisma goes. When my dad walked in a room, man, I'll tell you, you knew my father was in that room. He just exuded energy, just exuded. And I tell people that without any education that I think he was probably the smartest man I've ever met. He was so focused and read and educated himself. Uh, unfortunately, he was one of these guys who, who never really understood art. But And he would say, I know what I like, you know? <laughs> and that that's fine. There are a mm -hmm. lot of people. Mm -hmm. But he loved music, and that's pretty obvious why. And he had a really good ear. But uh, after he hopped on that train, and he came around, and... I don't know how and when he traveled on the road. I know some of it was with clothes and some of it was in the oil business. He was a landman, comes pre-war, World War II. Um, man he was working for was as to um, take on a big government job. My father found himself, as, himself, as he says, this is 1943, in 
um, with $10,000, which was more money than he had ever had in his life. Um, 43? Well, yes. 43. He's 43 years old, mm -hmm. and he has $10,000 in his pocket. He has a wife, two children. Tanta had just passed away, and uh, no means of doing anything. And he started a fascinating business, and many people have said to me, do you know what your father contributed to the oil business? And when I tell them what he did, they are amazed. My father began the oil services, uh, the log services in Texas. An electrical log is a like a cardiogram of the of what's down in the earth. And you don't drill a well, at least from the 1930s, I guess, without it. Um, wells, well logs were horse traded. You give me yours, I'll give you two of mine. And come the middle of the war, um, they just needed a lot more information in order to find oil. And my father had heard about this. He started the log services in Texas, and um, it started in the bedroom of my parents' home. You used to get oil, oil well logs that looked like on blueprints, and they looked like long. They'd be 12, 20 feet long, and you'd have to slice them with very long scissors. And you'd and anybody who did would get burns from the paper, just terrible mm -hmm. paper cuts. And then they would take them and roll them up and put them into canisters and send them away. The concept was sold by my father, who had the reputation for total integrity. And he went and, and to all the independents and most of the big ones, and he said to them, let me have your well log libraries. I will keep them and let me have access legally to every well that is drilled. And, when one, when, and then when somebody needs them, they can go to the library, we'll facilitate matters, we'll aid the war effort, and we'll get this thing off the road. And it, But I won't use any of that information till you give me legal access to it. Mm -hmm. And it was because of his reputation for absolute integrity that he sold that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very proud of him. And a lot yeah. of people have mm -hmm. said, wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Just as an aside, just... Um, did your children or you um, inherit any of this musical ability? I did. Mm -hmm. I did. I'm, I have a, a, I used, my violin teacher, I took violin for five years, I took piano for two. But then high school came along and I had other things I was doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, I, I lost it. But my teachers used to say I had perfect pitch. I don't know if that's still true or not. <laughs> I do know I know when, when somebody hits the wrong note or mm -hmm. it's yeah. a little flat. Yeah. I know that for yeah, sure. You've got an ear. Yeah. yeah. Um, on Forest, I want to get to you. Um, you lived in Forest at, at, until what age? I was 14. Mm -hmm. And that neighborhood, which was classic South Dallas, it wasn't Oak Cliff, South Dallas. Mm -hmm. It was on Forest, on yeah. the forest, forest. Martin mm -hmm. Luther King. Mm -hmm. It was only three blocks from Fair Park. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the neighborhood was beginning to change. And most of our friends were going to either, to mostly to Highland Park High School. Mm -hmm. And there were still some who stayed in Forest, at Forest High. But we decided to move, and we went to Woodland Drive, which is only three streets north of Northwest Highway, mm -hmm. right off of Preston. And we, and that meant that I went to Hillcrest High School. I could have got transferred and gotten to Highland Park somehow, but I chose not to. Mm -hmm. My parents also said, you can go to Hockaday. Again, I chose not to. Instead, I entered Hillcrest High School mm -hmm. as a sophomore, uh, in the middle of my sophomore year, and I stayed there for two and a half years. My graduating class had 50 people in it, mm -hmm. five O mm -hmm. at Hillcrest High School. Oh Is that gosh, amazing? Yeah. And I graduated in 1951. I was the only Jewish, full Jewish person there, there um, in my class, and then it started 
I had another girl who had a father who was Jewish and a mother who was not, mm -hmm. and never really associated with the Jewish community. And in a grade below me, I had a, a, a boy. Was there any anti-Semitism that, that you experienced? It didn't express itself at all as anti-Semitism, uh, but uh, for another reason, I really wasn't welcomed in. Now, we still meet this little group. There's still like 12 or 15 people who will get together, and we have lunches twice a year. Do would I know these people? Would no, we know these you people? would not know any of them. And they have, it was not a religious thing at all. There was another reason, and I don't really want to go into it here, but it was a very personal thing with the other half-Jewish girl who I had to debate with. And wow. she saw what a happy life I did, and she mm -hmm. I had, and um, she made it very difficult for me mm -hmm. from then on. Um, a little it all, jealousy going it, there. It was, and we were debate partners, and um, she had been with the same group for many years. Mm -hmm. um, and so she was one of these really good-looking gals, and I was gawky and skinny, and I didn't mature till I was 16. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I just never really fit in. But they... Nowadays, as adults, they have no memory of it, mm -hmm. and, and that's and that's mm -hmm. fine, you know. But um, I did. I spent a summer uh, at debate camp at University of Denver, and that changed my life. And my senior year was great because we used to have the Jewish kids would have dances, and rem you weren't here, and well, you weren't here. But in high school, there were all these Sweet Sixteen dances, and most of them would be at Lee Park, you know, with the mm -hmm. the, the um, mm -hmm. Arlington Hall at Lee mm -hmm. Park on Turtle Creek. And we'd have all these dances, and the invitations would come, you were invited to so-and-so's, and then it would say, <laughs> your date is... Uh-uh. Uh-huh. And it was wonderful because I got dates that way, because I, I really was not developed. I went into, high, into college at 16, turned 17, but I really was very, very slow. So I had that wonderful year, uh, summer, that I grew in, and then I had my Jewish friends from Highland Park and all the, you know, just the surrounding area. And some you even had them from Forest. I Adam. did. I did. Do you keep up with them? Yeah, oh, sh absolutely. <laughs> There's a whole group of, as a matter of fact, Forest people meet all the time. But I don't go to those reunions. Mm -hmm. But, um, oh, I know so many people here. Mm -hmm. So Give I me have some names friends. because that's always uh, fun with the, um, I, in this. I in will. This. I will. Well, there's Ethel. Frankfurt, uh, Ethel Silvergo Frankfurt mm -hmm. Zale mm -hmm. uh, was one of my best friends when we were in grade school, mm -hmm. and she used to she she didn't have a daddy, and she used to come over and spend the night with me, and we were on Forest Avenue, and and we had one full bathroom, and then one little toilet on the back porch, and she and I were just little girls. We used to get in this big claw-footed bathtub and take bubble baths together. My mother had poured a bottle of bubbles, and, <laughs> and we still talk about that. Yeah. Oh, there's, oh, golly, I wish I had thought, well, my distant cousin is was Jane Rutland Ray, uh, and she still lives here, and she's about a third cousin. We grew up together, uh -huh. though, because she uh -huh. was on South Boulevard, uh -huh. and um, she... Um, had a very interesting family. Her uncle was John Rosenfield, the the famous uh, critic for mm -hmm. the Times. Yeah. There, I mean, yeah. for the Dallas Morning News. And um, oh golly, uh, Dallas people. Ari Sussman was in grade school and part of high school with me, and he was always number one in class, and I was number two, mm -hmm. or vice versa. Oh my gosh! And um, I knew Arnie Sweet, and oh God, I just the uh, whole gang. There was a whole uh -huh. gang. There were gangs from Hillcrest, and there were lots of people from um, 
um, Highland Park. That's when I met Barbara Schwartz Silverberg. Uh, Silverberg. I knew Myrna, and um, Myrna Zapruder, Hauser, those. Reese, yeah. <laughs> Reese. And I'm, I knew my brother's friends. I knew Dave Andrus when I was a little girl. I say a little girl because he was my brother's age. That's eight years difference. And it doesn't matter when you're grown up, but when you're young, that's a lot of difference. Well, you talk about being this skinny, shy kid. It doesn't sound like you were at all, Polly. Well, you accumulate it. I, um, I didn't have a very good social history until I got to college. Mm -hmm. I, um, I wasn't shy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, in many ways, I was unsure of myself socially with my friends. Always good with my parents' friends. I was a debater. I won first in state in debate uh, with my partner. I could get out on stage. I could do those things. But as far as feeling confident going out on dates, and then somebody reminded me I had this boyfriend and I had this boyfriend, so I guess it wasn't as bad as I thought. Where did you go to college? Yeah, I went to college um, at two, my first two years at University of Texas, and I pledged AE Phi, and I lived in Scottish Rite Dormitory, and the women I grew some of them, oh, what am I talking about? There's Janet, uh, Janet Corn, bless Hirschman. She was um, my very best friend growing up. Uh, and she and I were born two days apart at mm -hmm. Florence Nightingale Hospital. And we have remained close friends ever mm -hmm. since. And I was made of honor in her wedding and vice yeah. versa. Yes. She's here, that's Hirschman. And um, there's just all kinds of people like that. My Janet and I were both the same age. My parents had said, go to Texas first, or Oklahoma, or Sophie Newcomb, stay close, and then you can go wherever you wanted. And I wanted to see the world. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to New York and work, and I wanted to go into theater or television or something. And I wanted to go to London, and I wanted to live there, but so what happened is I went to Texas, lived at SRD. The A5 house was just a fire trap. There was a whole group of us who did not um, go to the sorority house and were fined for it because mm -hmm. they wanted people <laughs> in the house. We all lived at SRD. We have all remained friends, mm -hmm. and that's really nice. Mm -hmm. And um, at and I was in Orange Jacket, I was in radio, TV, and drama, and I made so many of my lasting friends. I wouldn't give anything for that experience. And then I wanted to go away, as I had been promised. So I went to Northwestern, and that had, you know, a great school of speech. Mm -hmm. And I got into the drama class of the one of the internationally famous um, drama coaches, Elvira Krauss, and uh, that was quite an experience. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and it, it made me turn from being in drama to a radio TV, which mm -hmm. was, I felt, a much more down-to-earth approach, business-like. It was a strange world to be in the drama world, and mm -hmm. I'm glad I didn't stay in that. I, I lived at the A5 house. I met Len on, um, it wasn't, yeah, I guess it was a blind date fixed up by one of my roommates, and he was a senior in medical school uh, in Chicago, mm -hmm. and I'm a junior in uh, college at Northwestern, and he lived, his parents lived a short trolley ride away. They were at the edge of northern Chicago um, off of Devon area and then, and the lake, and here I am in Northwestern, which is, mm -hmm. Evanston just touched that. Mm -hmm. So it was a 10-minute car ride, and I don't know how long on, on the streetcar, but uh, he came up for a coffee date 
and walked me back to the house. Uh, you know, we had hours still. Mm -hmm. And he walked me back to the house, and I went upstairs, and I said to my roommates at the ripe age of 18, I said, I've met a man I think would be the first one I've ever met that I could marry. Just like your mother. Just like your mother and I, father. I guess. Yeah. I, except I never wanted to get married then. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to get married till I was, oh, 30. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> that's when I wanted to get a married. A woman ahead of her time. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, what happens, you... I was dating another guy off campus. By that time, I, I it was already very clear that boys my age were just not mature enough for me. I was dating a guy who was an attorney. Turned out they had gone to Illinois at the same time as Lynn. They didn't know each other, but one's an attorney, one's a physician. By the time Lenny and I got serious, uh, it was the end at the end of my junior year, and he proposed at the beginning of my senior year. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And and we got married after I graduated. I didn't even go to my own graduation because it wasn't the cool thing to do. And I got married, I got married in June, and uh, I got married in July. In I Dallas or In Chicago? Dallas uh -huh. at the Old Baker Hotel. And it's now torn down, it's, it's cat a corner from where the Adolphus is now, we're in the Crystal Ballroom, and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful wedding, and I have pictures, and Janet was my uh, ma matron of honor by that time, and I guess I had five brides, other bridesmaids, one of which was my dear friend, and still remains my one of my dearest friends, Lois K. Willard, um, who is a woman who is Catholic and devoutly so, and I met in the washroom, the ladies' room of a restaurant in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked. I was on my second date with Lynn, and we talked, and her date thought she had left him, and Lenny thought I had skipped out, talked for 45 minutes. Mm -hmm made a day to meet each other for lunch. She was already had her master's degree and was working in Chicago. We met the next Saturday for lunch in downtown Chicago. And uh, almost a year and a half later, she was in my wedding. <laughs> and flash forward many, many, many years, and, at, and she's older than I, about Lenny's age. And at age 70, I was matron of honor and only attendant in her first wedding at age 70. Oh. And she had always said I would be her matron of honor, and I was. <laughs> and it wasn't for lack of being asked. Mm -hmm. She just didn't choose anybody else. Mm -hmm. And she was very, very significant part of my, of my life. Um, I want to go from Chicago to, back to Dallas. Uh, what were your religious affiliations? I was always a, a good reform Jew. I, I was not the most observant person, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I was confirmed. You know, when I was growing up, there were very few boys who were bar mitzvah in Reform. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very few. Mm -hmm. Certainly my brother wasn't, and nobody that I know of who was in his age group that's Mort Prager was in his age group. He was not bar mitzvah that mm -hmm. I know of. Um, and, but they, all the boys were confirmed. Mm -hmm. And I had a confirmation class at Tim. As a matter of fact, I was in Rabbi Levi Olin's first confirmation class. He had just come here and he had become very good friends with my mother and dad. And I had a relationship with Lee, Rabbi Olin that was very special. You know, there was, he was a brilliant man and a wonderful teacher. But there were many people who found him off-putting as a warm, Hamisher rabbi. Exactly. Um, he, but to me and my parents, he was. Mm -hmm. And I, I really loved him and enjoyed him so much. So that was that, and I was, you know, I always went to services. Not Any organizations that you... I was, I don't 
think there were temple teens, mm -hmm. and I did not join uh, BBYO. Mm -hmm. You don't know this, Nancy, because you didn't come here till later. <clears throat> but most of BBYO was from the conservative community, oh. not from the oh. reform. That's most of them. Mm -hmm. um, now, Marilyn Goldman, Marilyn Coleman Goldman was was in one, and there were all kinds of people who were reformed, but nobody took me by the hand. Nobody said, oh, I want you to, to yeah. join, yeah. so I just didn't. Mm. And... Um, but it didn't make any difference. All of us reform kids used to go to our services, and then we'd all go over to Sheriff Israel yeah. on were the your, park. Were your parents um, active in the Jewish community? Um, yeah, my mother was always in, in um, sisterhood. <laughs> and my dad did different things, stayed in the Boy Scout community for a long time. Uh, Alvin Goldstein was one of his first Boy Scouts, Oh, I'll tell you who was one of my mother's Sunday school um, uh, pupils was uh, the man, uh, Henry S. Miller. And when he was invited to mother's 95th birthday, uh, he sent her roses. And again, on her 100th birthday, he sent her roses. Oh. Maybe on her 90th, too. We had 90th, 95th, and 100th. Oh. And wow. so he remembered, oh, <laughs> and it was wow. very sweet. All kinds of people were dad's Boy Scout leaders, our mother's, um, our mother's uh, Sunday school. I want to get to my favorite topic having to do with Pauline Grevere. Oh. Tell me about your line of careers <laughs> when, uh, when because there's been a few of them, <laughs> and uh, and. Actually, Let's start with that because they're fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's my daughter Tracy who has had a line of careers even more than I. Oh, I started out, I had a radio show in Evanston. It was a children's radio show, but it gave me experience. And um, then when I graduated, Lenny and I, I, I spent the next nine years away from Dallas. So it's 13 years in all. And Where were you in Chicago? Um, we married, and Lynn was supposed to go into the service immediately, and as a physician, he was just through with one year of a rotating internship. They don't have them anymore. They were like, the, it would be called a residency, a surgical residency. But in his case, it was rotating, and he was supposed to go in the service, and he had been put off. At any rate, um, we were supposed to marry, and immediately go in to the Air Force, go overseas, and he was supposed to be a flight surgeon in Germany. And they put him off and put him off and put him off until finally he had to get a job. And after our wonderful honeymoon, we ended up going back to Chicago, and he got, he's waiting, had to turn down his residencies. And he got a job just in an industrial clinic wasted a whole year and we lived in the basement of one of our friend's parents old houses <laughs> and the the parents lived on the first floor of this big old converted house our friends lived on the um, one daughter and family and children lived on the second floor the other daughter who were our friends lived above a five-car garage. They were in the coach house. Lenny and I were in the servants' quarters <laughs> <laughs> because we needed a place to live. Yeah. It was like, doctor, we're calling you in another six weeks. Mm -hmm. We're calling you in another eight weeks. And so, and it was like my sister Eileen, where you, your eyes were on ground level. <laughs> <laughs> One time we had a flood, and, and Lenny had the mumps, <laughs> and I wouldn't let him out of bed because we didn't have children, and uh, so he stayed in, and the water was rising. <laughs> also, not a very good situation it, it for claustrophobic. It was, yeah. it was. Those are the experiences. They mm. finally got called. We went into the service. I got pregnant, but meanwhile, I had started to, again, two years 
and he ended up in Oklahoma, in Midwest City, Oklahoma, and um, he was an obstetrician. <laughs> that year of rotating internship gave him the experience, so it, it was disappointing, but you, you make the lot. best of it, you make the best of it, and we ended up having a great time. And I was doing some freelance modeling, even when I was pregnant, <laughs> I was wearing loose jackets, you know, and that was fun, you know, mm -hmm. sort of idiot work, but yeah, mm -hmm. it was fun. And then we spent um, another six years on his residency. He came back to Chicago, to Cook County Hospital, and I was having more babies and and he just wasn't making any money. Mm -hmm. Twenty hundred and twenty five dollars a month mm -hmm. for four and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then he went that was general surgery at Cook County and then Pittsburgh Children's for a year and a half. And during that time I'm having babies and I am doing some freelance work and conducting classes in charm. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. that's really How what many it children? was. How many children? Three, three. Uh -huh. um, we had Lisa um, when I was. Let's see. She came. We married in 1955, and she came in at the end of 57. And she's now an attorney and has been an attorney for many years uh, in St. Louis. And then we had Miles uh, 17 months later. And he is a surgeon in, a plastic surgeon in Atlanta, and he has two children, and all happily married. And then Tracy came along three and a half years later, so that gave, and she is the one who lives in Dallas. She lived in uh, Montreal for many, many years, married to a Montreal man, and divorced and re remarried another man from Montreal, who was happy to move to Dallas, oh. and she had one child with a uh, first marriage and two children now, and she and husband and two children live here in Dallas. Thank heavens I've got one. <laughs> Everybody's very close. We vacation together, and they're very close and all love each other, so I've got uh, three, six children, mm -hmm. counting married in, and seven Five. grandchildren. Seven. Seven? Two, two, and three. Two. Oh, okay. Your your other daughter. Right, and oh. they range in age from three to twenty five. So, are you a grandma? I, I'm a grandmother. I uh, mean, a great grandma? No, no, not yet. The okay. twenty five year old is was her first child, Tracy's first child, mm -hmm. and thank heavens he's not <laughs> married, and he lives and works in in uh, New York City, and uh, that is Lee. My father's name was Lee Pierce. Mm -hmm. He legally changed it from Herman Leonard. I'm trying to think what the original name was. Gutenplan. Gutenplan. And he changed it to H. Lee Pierce. And Tracy's first son is named Lee, and her second son is named Pierce. Ah. Sort of sweet. <laughs> Go on. Um, and uh, it's, is it it's time to stop. And then but I just real quickly. Go on with your career that you've had for 25 years. Well, once when I moved back to Dallas, my mother said, you and Gloria Huffman need to get together. Now, I have, it's 10 minutes worth of telling you this quick story about this career. Do you have time on the date? No, because I want to ask you one more question. Okay, well, I, who, who I can't your, okay. do that in that shorter time. It's yeah. a 10 minute. Can you use another time? Nancy, you asked me about career, mm -hmm. and I guess, aside from my family, mm -hmm. who I consider my products, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, the thing I'm the most proud of is the career that I carved out along with Gloria Hoffman. And Gloria Hoffman, uh, I don't know whether she ever did one of these. I think so. She and I carved out a career together. Neither one of us could have done it by ourselves. Gloria passed away seven years ago, but I must include her. Uh, the story really is, is a good one. After all these years of training that Lynn had and away, we moved back to Dallas. My mother, darling Regina Pierce, said, you and Gloria, she'd always said, when you come back to Dallas, you and Gloria need to have a 
do a career together. Gloria had created a television show over in Fort Worth named Charmingly Yours with Gloria Myers. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, had a children's show and had been teaching charm, you know, all of these things that one teaches young people and adults. Anyway, Gloria called me one day. I was busy building a house, had these three little children. And she said, do you want to go on the board of the YWCA with me? Uh, Newman was starting. And we ended up doing that. We weren't interested in charm at all. But the idea of joining in something and programming together, my mother had put into both of our heads. She was good friends with Gloria. And we realized that the world, meaning our Texas, Dallas, Texas world, there were so many people in her volunteer world, because uh, she was living here and volunteering, who would not take a position of responsibility because they were afraid to make a speech. And so we started a little class, and the first one we called um, um, Cultivating Courage because hmm. of fear. And a reporter, Mary Brinkerhoff, from the Dallas Morning News, called us on the phone, didn't even see us, called us on the phone and interviewed us for hours and was fascinated with this idea of teaching people to have confidence in spite of fear. A photographer came out, found two women who were used to being on television and were hams, and I get really excited when I tell you about this, and were hams and takes pictures. On a Saturday morning, we open up the paper, and there on the front of the variety or the women's page, whatever you want to call it, were four pictures of the two of us, half a page and half of the next page. And the title is Helps on the Way for Terrified Talkers. Helps on the Way for Terrified Talkers, and underneath that was Cultivating Courage. Mm -hmm. And two days later, in a very small church in Northwest Dallas, 79 people show up. Now that's a lot of people yes, yes, yes. to learn how to speak before groups. Gloria and I were oh, the petrified. Date, the date on this? Pardon? The date? Oh, uh, that was 1964. Um, okay, 1960. Yeah. We had just moved back, 1964. Mm -hmm. And we were petrified. <laughs> we weren't teachers. <laughs> but we quickly regrouped. We, uh, we had those people in smaller groups right away. Uh, we took every advantage. We went from there, because you can't get that many people every time for the y, a Y course. We went to El Centro. We put in a conversational communications course we realized you have to have listening in order to communicate. It's not all talking like I'm doing here. You need to listen and interact with people. All of that's my mother's training and my father's training. And we went into the business world. We parlayed it. We took every advantage. We just looked for advantages. People were mentors to us. I became, both of us became professional platform speakers. As we progressed, we're working more and more in the business community. We ended up hiring 20 people. They were all over the world doing seminar, short seminars at meetings and conventions. We're doing a lot of work in the, in the world of executive training. And uh, long story short, here we are, and I keep saying we because that was Gloria too, and working with the top executives in the country. Mm -hmm and doing work globally, and um, just doing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm still doing it. I am here at, at my age of 77. There's no reason for me to retire because people are still coming to me. And you love it. And I love mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Every day is different. Every person is different. I teach short seminars. I take longer, teach longer seminars, and I'm turning people into not only great speakers, but as many of them say, I changed their life. And what better way is there to to learn to live a life? Mm -hmm. And that's my life. You're a fascinating woman. 
Mrs. Gravier, and this has been a pleasure. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> when else do I get to talk like this? <laughs> oh. <laughs> we have a lot of PA due to Pauline's last interview. Some very important um, components to who she is and, uh, and her family. Good afternoon, Pauline. Hello. Thank you so much. Okay. Do you want to start all over? Do you want to start? Okay. Um, tell me, uh, tell, uh, tell us about your, uh, your history and your, uh, you left out something that goes back hundreds of years. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> How could I have left that? I don't, I, know. I don't know. I don't know. I am so sorry. And thank you for the opportunity to, to continue this. Yes. Well, the black sheep of the family, and probably my claim to fame, is my great, great, great uncle. And Natalie Ornish, in her book, Pioneer Jewish Texans, uh, this is just a Xerox copy of the front. I couldn't find my I couldn't find it, so this is old and it's in a family notebook. But I want to read you quickly this one paragraph that says, uh, in an interview, 1987, with my mother, Regina Pierce, uh, she talks about her great-great-uncle, A. Wolf, A, for Anthony Wolf, who was killed at the Alamo. He had been with Jean Lafitte in his encampment and went from New Orleans to Galveston. He was the black sheep of the family. Nobody wanted to talk very much about it. And as a child growing up, and I've already discussed that, I heard about him on my mother's side. My mother was Flora Wolf. I'm quoting my mother. That's my grandmother who married David Hart. My mother was born in New Orleans, circa around 1870. And my father came to America to work for his uncle in Athens, Alabama. And he came on down to be a cotton uh, buyer in Bryan, Texas. And so anyway, um, uh, this marriage contract, which I have, is uh, very interesting. Anyway, um, the information I received, dot, 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 the information I received from my mother's brother, David Wolf of Galveston, was that Anthony Wolf had been the part, what I just told you, and that he was killed at the Alamo. When New Orleans chased Lafitte and his troops out of New Orleans, they went to the Isle of Galveston, and that's when the call came to go to the Alamo. That's where he went. Now, the archives at the Alamo in the Texas State Library show that he was acting as an interpreter on a scouting mission to the Cherokee Nation. And also, he showed up at the Alamo, and um, this is what I have done from other research. He showed up at the Alamo, Alamo, as my mother said, he was a scalawag. But as you recall, all of the rogues came to the Alamo. They were not such a high-class group of people. According to the records, he was, had been married to a Mexican woman, who was at the Alamo with him, along with two small sons. It is unclear whether she's one of the women who begged for mercy, but what is clear is that he had two sons with him and the three of them were killed at the Alamo. And if you look on the big granite sign, a Anthony Wolf is the last name. So, <laughs> my claim to that. That is wonderful. Isn't that exciting? Okay. Well, I'm just curious, tell me what may a scalawag in those days. Yeah. Why was he the black sheep? What made him a black well, sheep? He was a pirate. You know, Lafitte, John Lafitte was supposed to have been Jewish. His name was supposed to have been Lafito. Mm -hmm. And uh, who knows what his history was. He did come from England. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was the background. It was England and Germany mm -hmm. for that side of the family. Mm -hmm. That's the extent of what I know, but it's pretty exciting because in the Pan American Exposition, we went down to San Antonio and went through the all of the big show for the Alamo, and there he was, and it talked about him being the only Jew at the Alamo. Wow. So that's pretty exciting. Oh, no, it certainly <laughs> is. It certainly is. Thank you. Thank you for letting us come back and review <laughs> some important things. But I'm eyeing over here 
several books, about three books, and what do you have to do with these books? Well, these are books that my partner, my late partner, Gloria Hoffman, and I wrote, and that's the other thing I left out, and I really wanted to talk about uh, what other people have said was my and Gloria's contribution to the cause of business women, mm -hmm. so, so to speak. Exactly. There are a lot of business women today. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough not to have been born 20 years earlier when those were the real women pioneers. Those were the, the women who struggled to get a job as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. we, we, you, we have many, mm -hmm. several women here in Dallas mm -hmm. who were brilliant and mm -hmm. took them forever to get a job as a lawyer and not a paralegal mm -hmm. or a secretary. I didn't have to make those kinds of intense forays into the world of men. It was much easier. However, however, that said, the idea of becoming a coach for men who were successful executives was not a very common thing when Gloria and I started. We were very fortunate. We were blessed with publicity. Everywhere we turned, somebody wanted to write an article for us. And it really was the Dallas Morning News. And then later on, Vivian Castlebury at the Dallas Times Herald, who really pushed us out into the f forefront. We uh, began, we were both had radio TV backgrounds, never taught a course in our lives, never ever had any business experience, so to speak. We were, we were performers of one kind or another. And we started a little course for the YWCA that my mother had suggested. She was a friend of Gloria's already. They were both founders of the Brandeis University National Women's Auxiliary. And they became really good friends. And mother always said, when Polly comes back to Dallas, the two of you have to do, some, do something. I think what she thought was a charm class, something like that, <laughs> that we had each taught before. I in Chicago and Gloria in uh, Fort Worth. Anyway, we got together and we thought of an idea for people who were afraid to take volunteer jobs of any note because they were afraid to make a speech. And so we taught, we, we came up with this little course. It was going to be four one hour lessons given for the YWCA in a church in Northwest Dallas. And the whole idea was that we would, if we had to literally hold somebody's hand, we would hold somebody's hand and get them over their fear enough to control it and to be able to use it to make a presentation. That was the concept of starting. And we opened up the Saturday paper before a Monday class in the Dallas Morning News. And Mary Brinkerhoff had written this column called, and this huge, um, I should have brought it out and showed it to you, but if you can imagine the newspaper this big and half of it with copy and half of the second page and four pictures of the two of us splattered, I mean, who could buy that? And it says, helps on the way for terrified talkers. Mm. And there was nobody to answer the phone at the Y. This was a Saturday. They didn't have classes. And it was just, you know, just a concept. And we walked in, and there were 79 people waiting for us to take this course. And oh, I, I have to tell you that we both panicked. Now, later on, when I was writing a column for the Dallas Morning News on business and such, I wrote about this after Gloria passed away, and I made it sound as though she was the only one who was confident, but the, but the truth was we were both scared out of our minds. So <laughs> we faced these people. We realized that we had to break it up. We got through the first hour somehow, <laughs> panicked as we were, and... It was a great success. We had speakers, anonymous classes, all kinds of people who you would know, and some in the Jewish community, including Patsy Nash, uh, were amongst our first students. Mm -hmm. And 
we had speakers anonymous and it was great fun. Glory and I wanted to do more. It was clear that we couldn't depend on the Y to constantly get us business. So we marched ourselves down to El Centro, which was the very first junior college, and we said, here we are. And they said, oh, we want you, we want you for our adult education. And after we had taught there for a little while, they said, and can you teach a conversation course? And we said, sure, we can do that. You know, this is what happens when you're not very um, knowledgeable, mm -hmm. I would say. And so we started that, and the more we looked into it, we realized that the basis of conversation, and therefore the basis of the majority of communications, is listening skills. So we went looking for books on listening, and they were all full of technical things, you know, what, what the ear and the ear canal does, and so on. And there was almost nothing out on how people listen and what they learn from their listening. So Gloria and I wrote it. And just as we wrote our presentation skills, we did it not from an academic background, because we didn't really have any. We did it from what we thought would work and how one needs to put it into writing and into seminars. Well, it took off and was very exciting. In the, and we did the conversation course. We morphed into communications of all types, including the presentations and the interpersonal. I didn't know any other name for it. Along the way, all of a sudden, boom, we started to grow. I guess that's what happens. We were very blessed with the timing because it was very easy to get an appointment. Two women coming in to see the CEO of a major firm will, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. come right in. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so we made our pitches and, our, and we had two-day seminars and all of a sudden we've got, and we are working now for, as consultants for University Computing Company and LTV Education, which are just realizing that one has to have management and executive development courses, that that is a very important thing. So here we are, we caught the wave, and as they say, timing is everything. Mm -hmm. And um, we feel very strongly that the timing can be there, but the person has to be ready to grab it when it passes by. Mm -hmm. And that is actually amongst the first thing that we've written in our book, which was published back in the 80s, but the nice thing is, speaking language is success, but the nice thing is, is that it was published by Putnam's. We wanted the caveat of a major publisher, and we were very fortunate to get it. And it, they called it a bestseller, and it went into paperback with Berkeley Paperback Press, these. And apparently, not only were these in bookstores uh, all around the country, but these ended up in kiosks, in uh, airports, oh. and uh, all over the place. And they kept selling out of these. I don't know how, I think they did a couple of printings of the hardcover, and then it went into this. And I would end up, we'd end up getting, getting calls from people who had it in college. College classes were using it. I look at it now, and you know what, it's a little dated. Uh, we decided on our concepts of organized listening. That was the premise that you listen uh, and you divide your listening into various categories. So you don't go in and just have a funnel going into your head mm -hmm. and you're supposed to listen. Mm -hmm. You go in and you say, I'm going to be listening for a person's name. I'm going to be listening for points of agreement. This person is a little difficult to work with. I'm going to do points of agreement. Or I'm about to say something there that has to be with a change, but the change has to happen in a certain way. You don't just walk into somebody and say, you're thinking this way, I'm thinking this way, we have to go this way. No, it's the strategy of how you think ahead of time and the strategy of what you say. Mm -hmm. and then the ability to switch at a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. So the listening went from 
11 concepts of organized listening to 17 concepts of organized listening, which it is now. So, all of a sudden, it seems like all of a sudden, but it was over a period of years, we find ourselves dealing with business executives and the nuclear engineers. And I, I mean, it went from going to a Dr. Pepper plant in Ohio, but then billing us as P. Hoffman, as G. Hoffman and P. Gravier because they didn't think anybody would come if they knew it was being taught by women uh -huh. to Pauline Gravier, Roy mm -hmm. Hoffman. We soon realized we shouldn't teach together, so we each taught separately, but we taught the same thing, however, in different ways. When we were asked to go into the convention meeting business and do short versions of our seminar, we realized we could not do it ourselves, and we began to hire other people. They were always women. They were always charismatic. Um, and we ended up with about 20 people who were working for us. I don't think there were ever 20 at one time, but there were maybe six or eight at one time, and then people would morph off uh, because Nobody wanted to do anything but teach. <laughs> they didn't want to go out and sell it. It was fun. We were traveling all over the world. I have really taught in some of the most beautiful and incredible places in every resort type of situation. We have taught uh, our seminar to English-speaking people in Austria, Japan, Morocco, Canada, on board a ship, <laughs> the cruise ship, mm -hmm. I mean, you name it, Mexico, um, Hawaii, and so on, many times for very large, large conventions. We've been part of the American Bar Association, for which they give credits, the same for accountants. Uh, we, um, you know, you name it, I think I've worked with, I can touch somebody's business no matter what they do. So you name an engineer, any kind of engineer, I work with them. And, and, and uh, so the way the business has marked is that we, after a very long period of traveling, my health began to suffer. It was harder to travel and to do these kinds of seminars. I was also a keynote speaker. And it became harder and harder, and we began to Close that part down for a while while I was having a lot of surgery. And then um, we began to, to also, uh, at the same time, we were approached by a literary agent who dealt with China. And this is the translation of Speaks the Language of Su Success oh, and the translation into Mandarin. This was for Taiwan. And it was, and it's all, <laughs> it's oh, all Mandarin my. Chinese. The only thing that says, speak the language of success is right here. And it is, uh, then it went into a second translation for mainland China, which as you know, does a, a simplified language version. And that got sold out totally. And when I was in Japan, I mean in China about seven years ago, I went looking for it. All the bookstores had it in their list, but they were sold out. So that was it. So it has been a terrific ride. This is the, it just, you know, the audio version. So that's where I am now. And I have to say that even though I don't feel it, people refer to me as an icon or a trendsetter or a trailblazer or whatever it was. But all I can tell you is that Gloria and I, as partners, had a fabulous time. We had a fabulous experience. And while I never walked into a seminar and said, hello there, I'm Jewish, um, there was no question. And if anyone ever said anything that I was afraid that they would be embarrassed by, like, to marry, I want her to marry a good Christian man, or, or she, he had good Christian values, then in the gentlest of ways, I would 
us, no. can you be an ethical person and not be Christian? And mm -hmm. so you do that kind of thing without embarrassing anybody. But I think it's nice to say that as a Jew, I was a standard bearer. Well, you definitely are a trailblazer <laughs> and a great credit to Dallas oh. as well as um, our Jewish community. And I'm so glad you let some of this information drop days after the last interview. <laughs> I left it <laughs> so, out. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you so much.